Ironically, this is kind of a definition that ChatGPT gave of what generative AI is, which is a certain form of AI. Um, you don't need to read all that. If you flip to the next page, right, the, the elements and components of generative AI. So there's kind of four. The first is that generative AI creates new content. I think that's kind of self-explanatory, but content really can mean words, images, video, music, even um, something that's new and, and original. There's a certain component, which is that it's trained on huge amounts of data. You know, whenever you hear the phrase like uh, a model was trained on something, that's really what what it means, right? It it has processed and and gone through and sifted through huge amounts of data to try to extract the next component, which are patterns and processes. Data, patterns, and processes are are important, and just like that, uh, generative AI uses these elements as well. And finally, and this is kind of the key that separates generative AI from other AI in sheep's clothing, so to speak, right? It makes sense and fits context. Fitting context, understanding subtext. Um, I was joking with Manny the other day about how like good AI understands sarcasm and humor. Previous technology really struggled with that, right? They, they took a literal understanding of everything, so or classified three different types or tiers of, of AI to, to help everybody understand. The first is what I call algorithmic AI, and this utilizes predefined inputs to create predefined outputs. And the easiest kind of um, vertical example I can give is back in the day when you called into a customer service or, or some really um, old technophobic companies, You'll have those those call routing prompts that are like press one for this department, press two for this department, press three for this department. Right? It's a very uh, kind of primitive form of AI. Uh, you, you only have certain amounts of inputs, and then each input is pre coded or you know hard coded into a specific outcome. Now, one of the challenges with algorithmic AI is the following. So this is a bit of a computer science joke. Uh, my mom said, honey, please go to the market and buy one bottle of milk. If they have eggs, bring six. I came home with six bottles of milk. The message that I'm trying to get across is that everything is hard coded. And if you don't account for every single possibility of misinterpretation, you get misinterpretation, right? This is where computer glitches and bugs or if you've ever played a video game that really bugs out, this is what happens with algorithmic AI. And no matter how sophisticated it becomes, you, you still run into these issues. So if we look at the next, the kind of next iteration is what I call interpretive AI, where you have unlimited inputs, right? But there are still predefined responses. Taking kind of the, the, the previous analogy forward, today, if you call certain companies, uh, for customer service, they'll say something like, in your own words, please tell me a little bit about what your issue is, right? And so the idea is to take undetermined inputs, they have no idea actually what you're gonna give it, try to interpret what is being said because often what's said is just in plain English, right? But on the back end, once it's kind of interpreted um, what it needs to interpret, it still has predefined responses. Your, your call uh, management system is still going to route it to a specific department or service specific function, even if what you gave was, was an undefined input. Now, if we go to the final, is really what we call generative AI which is not only are the inputs unlimited and, and undefined, predefined, so to speak, your responses are also unlimited and undefined. So ChatGPT really straddles, for example, I, I bring that up because I'm sure everyone here is most familiar with that. The second and third iterations, you know, Google search is an example of interpretive AI, but as we begin to see these image generation programs um, these video creation programs, right? These are generative in nature because the AI program did not 
predetermined the outcomes that, that come out of this. It was trained on large sets of data. So we're going to go to the headlines for a moment, right? What is ChatGPT? What is AI? What is all this stuff? I looked up GPT. Okay, read a few references, got there, read up LLMs. Oh, okay, got there. Then I said, well, what's going on here? How does this all work? So I looked it up and I got some, somebody thought it was helpful content online, not necessarily me. And I said, LL, LLMs are a subset of generative AI that's multimodal. I had to look that up. What's multimodal? And that's kind of when I said, okay, you know what? Here's what I really need to know. Because after all, if you're trying to keep your floors clean, do you need to know how to design a vacuum cleaner or do you need to know where the power switch is? So here's the power switch for AI. AI is a workflow enhancer. It is not a replacement for jobs yet. Now, if your job is to strictly enter data without interpretation or analysis, you might be thinking about upskilling, let's just say. For the moment, at least, we don't see any time where it's going to be anything more than the computer in Star Trek. I, that's what I see, right? Really smart, knows lots more facts than, than you do or I do, but is probably not really going to be making independent decisions. And that's part of what you'll find that you can't ask for an end result in AI and get it, you know, get it in one and walk away happy. It's, you got to work at it. So what can you do with AI? Here's some of the things I'm doing with it, right? Smart research. Let's just say I'm a quality manager. I want to know about a new paint technology that I'm considering or that I'm having to figure out how to, to measure. So I could do some smart research and really get a lot of information from a lot of places. Two tricks that I love, generating summaries from articles, generating articles from summaries, right? Huge. It can't write programs, but it can write chunks of programs. And it's really good at that. And now, now, so, <laughs> let's hear from the other guy. Point so so I, have, point. I have a bit of a dissenting opinion. And part of that is because, it, again, I, I work in the finance investment world. So... I, I keep, kind of keep up with trends when it comes to companies, things of that nature. Um, the, the reason why I lay out the kind of three types or three stages of AI, you can also look at it in terms of a time series, right? Algorithmic AI has been around for a long time. So you've got, you know, ATMs, for example, are an example of algorithmic AI. And we, we forget, but the, the number of tellers that existed pre-ATMs versus after uh, there's a bit of a difference there, right? And so now lots of companies are implementing interpretive AI to boost their own productivity. And as I listen to lots of earnings calls, like the, the, the most creative thing that most company managers can think of is to use AI to cut costs. So I, uh, again, I challenge you to just call it random, random companies and ask about their customer service, right? Um, ultimately interpretive AI is, is kind of disrupting certain industries more than others due to the nature of the work itself. So let's kind of think for a moment about what roles are interpretive in nature. Let's think low level diagnostic medicine, for example, right? You, you come in, you talk about your complaints and then right now, like a physician's assistant or, or you know, family medicine doctor kind of interprets what you say and then tries to shoehorn it in to a predefined outcome, i.e. a diagnosis. Let's think of some of the things that paralegals do. And I bring up these industries because these are the industries that are, we actually are actively seeing a shakeup. So law, accounting, all of these things are interpretive in nature. Hey, here's a transaction in, in the income statement, we need to classify it as a certain type of expan uh, expanse or, or, you know, chart of accounts. We need to figure out where it goes. That's exactly within the wheelhouse of interpretive AI. Um, when it comes to coders, for example, if, if there's any software developers out there, right? I, I think there's some studies that have shown that chat GPT alone, not even to include, you know, more private models are allowing programmers to be seven times more productive. That those are the top coders. So now that's a whole swath of junior coders that those jobs won't exist. Now, could you argue that a job not existing doesn't mean that somebody loses their job? I mean, that's some logical mental gymnastics, but but ultimately you'll you'll see the progress 
in which this happens, right? For example, one of the things that I use generative AI for is content creation in terms of images. Almost every image that you'll see on here that I created for the presentation was made through some uh, image generator. I don't need to pay for royalties, right? So five jobs, I guess. So, okay. So I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I, I, I just wanted to give a slightly dissenting opinion. Okay. Back to you, Manny. 